Okay, this is section 15.8, and we are going to be covering Stokes' theorem in this particular section. Um, and there are seven questions. I did leave four and five for you to do. Um, so hopefully you can figure that those two out with um, what we do for um, parts for problems three, six, and seven. Okay. So there should be enough information in there for you to figure out how to do number four and number five. So number three works a lot like number four and five. So you can probably use that one as a um, example. Except I will let you know that I did leave the more challenging ones for you to do. So I'll talk about how they are more challenging when we get to those problems, okay? Um, just to kind of give you a little bit of hints or advice. So um, for number one and number two, all they were asking was for the curl. And we did have a few examples of how to determine the curl in the previous uh, video, but there's some more practice with this one because with Stokes theorem, you do need the curl. So I guess it's just trying to like um, go through that and that whole process just as a reminder, okay? So here's my vector field. I did put it in component form and then I did set up the, um, matrix so that I can find the determinant and I know what's going to go where, right? So it's I, J, K, and then it's um, D, D, X, D, D, Y, D, D, Z, and then first component, second component, and third component of my vector field. So as I go through the process, uh, the derivative with respect to Y of this is X, Z. The derivative with respect to Z of this is E to the Z, and I subtracted those. Then you have a minus sign for the second component. And then the derivative with respect to x of this is yz minus the derivative with respect to z of this, which is just negative one. And then finally, the last one, derivative with respect to x of this is zero minus the derivative of this with respect to y is just nine. So I cleaned it up a little bit. I do still have those two terms. Here we have a negative yz and a negative times a negative times a negative does end up being negative one. And here, this computation is just negative nine. So I did type that in there and it was correct. Now for number two, same thing. I put the function or the vector field in um, component form. And then I set up my matrix again, just the same components in order. And then the derivative with respect to y of this is 4z squared minus the derivative of this with respect to z. There's no z's, so it's zero. Then the negative sign for the next term, derivative with respect to x of this is zero minus the derivative with respect to z of this is also zero. Finally, the derivative with respect to x of this is going to be negative y times negative sine x and minus, and then the derivative with respect to y of this is just x cosine y. So I cleaned it up a little bit. That's just four z squared. This is all just one big zero. And then the third uh, component is gonna be a positive y sine x minus x cosine y. And I did type that in there and it did mark it as correct, okay? No idea why my eyeball is itching right now, but it is. Okay, there we go. So number three, we have this here. And it does ask us for um, this thing here going counterclockwise viewed from above. So I did put my vector field in component form, 2y, 3z, and x. And then I did apply the Stokes theorem, which turns it into this. Um, and then I did try to find my normal, um, my normal vector. So, um, and I definitely need to evaluate the curl because we will need the curl and the normal vector. Okay, now for to find the normal vector, we do need to know, um, if you remember, I, my computer's thing, I hope everything doesn't turn off if I, because I am working on the side of my computer and I keep coming off camera in order, you can't see me, okay. Um, but I have turned my screen before and then everything's shut off. So I was trying to be very careful. Um, but anyway, 
So we have a plane here, right? The plane, it says a triangle with the vertices. So that's the curve they're talking about. But if you draw that triangle, it does create basically a plane in three-dimensional space. Um, and, and you can go review how to find the equation of the plane if you forgot. Um, but I did go ahead and write the equation of the plane here. Um, again, if you don't know how to find the equation of a plane, please go back to your previous chapters and look over how to find the equation of the plane, okay? Um, but I did write the equation of the plane here, and if you plug in zero and zero, you get z equal to nine, which is that point there. If you plug zero and zero, you get y equal to nine, which is that point there. And if you plug zero and zero, you get x equal to nine, which is this point here. So it does correspond with the triangle with those vertices, okay? Now I did put it in the xy plane because when you apply, um, this formula here, what you're going to end up with is um, just a double integral, okay? And so I knew my double integral was going to be um, dy dx, and so I did go ahead and put it in dy dx. So I did consider what's going on in just the xy plane, um, and I noticed that I had those two points, positive, x, positive 9 for x uh, intercept, and positive nine for the y-intercept. So I drew that on the xy plane, those intercepts. And then this equation, again, if you should at this point know how to find the equation of a line, but um, that is going to be the equation of that line. So I did go ahead and find the normal vector just by doing basically the gradient of this. Um, so, and I wanna write it in different, different letters because I noticed later when we talk about it, um, we do have to use certain letters. And I noticed that in the solutions in WebAssign, it also uses certain letters. So what they do is they use G of X, Y, Z. And since we weren't given um, this function, uh, normally you would take the X plus Y plus Z that you found in your plane and then just subtract the nine over. And so you get this as your, um, g of x. So I'm just going to write my plane here. And then I'm going to say let g equal this, okay? And then what you want to do is you want to find the gradient of g. And so the gradient of g is going to be 1, 1, and 1. Derivative with respect to x, derivative with respect to y, and derivative with respect to z, okay? Um, and so something else you need to know is that this integral can be converted into this integral. DA. And so we want the DA in the region so that I'm talking about this XY plane since I have some information for that XY plane. Um, so when I found the gradient of G, it is the one, one, one. And the reason why I'm using this notation G is because they do use that notation later um, when it's not just a plane, it's actually a curve that you're talking about, okay? Um, and so they just move the nine, the constant over, and they get this as g, okay? Um, and then of course, that's the gradient. In order for us to calculate the curl, I did set it up and I put in all three of my components. And so then I found that's gonna be zero minus three, so it's negative three. This is gonna be in negative one plus zero, which is this. And then finally, the last one's gonna be um, zero minus two, so we get negative two. So I have my curl dot product with my gradient of F, and then since it's dA, I have dy dx. And in the xy plane, my y is going from zero to this line, so those are my bounds for y. And then my x is going from zero to nine, and so those are my bounds for x. Now, after finding this dot product, we actually ended up with the value of negative six, when we integrate negative six with respect to y, we end up with negative six y. If I plug in my bounds for y, I end up with this expression. I did go ahead and distribute that negative six. And then I integrated each, each term with respect to x. So I end up with negative 54x plus 3x squared. And I need to evaluate that at my bounds. I plugged in the nines, plugged in the zeros. I ended up with these two terms. And after that um, combination of like terms, I ended up with negative 243. Okay, now if you need to slow down and go through this on your own to process that, please do so. 
um, and make sure that you can verify the quantities that I have here. Okay, so we'll move on to talk about number four. So number four, if you notice, it's a different, um, um, I keep re not remembering the name of this thing. I, uh, it's a different vector um, field, but it does have the same kind of curve here. So you are still talking about those vertices, okay? But notice that these vertices are not quite the same as the vertices for this one, okay? So in this particular problem, you definitely, um, your triangle is basically gonna be facing a different direction, not facing the direction like mine was. Um, and so you definitely have to know how to find the equation of a plane in order to do that. So definitely go back, review how to find the um, equation of a plane when given three points, um, and you should be able to come up with that, with that plane equation. Once you come up with that plane equation, you're going to do the same thing here where you're gonna let um, G equal that um, plane minus whatever constant you end up with on the other side, okay? And then you'll find the gradient of that plane, the curl you will all do the same, and then your bounds you will all do the same. Um, so definitely take a look at that one. And if you wanna figure out what's going on in the XY plane, all you have to do is set, um, set your uh, z equal to zero and you can get the equations for the xy plane. Okay, now for number five, I also skipped that one too because there were no variations here. So I didn't wanna do it or I would do your problem specifically. So you definitely wanna figure out the curl. And then um, here you would actually, um, this one's counterclockwise. So for this one, my advice for number five is that you let um, G equal, I'm gonna say for number five, let G equal um, one minus X squared minus Y squared minus Z, okay? Actually, it should be the other way around. You should be subtracting the other guys. So Z stays there and then you're gonna do minus one minus x squared minus y squared, okay? So once you have that, you can distribute your negative and then you can find the gradient of g. So that's my hints for number, number five. You also wanna probably use polar coordinates for number five. So I'm gonna do another problem that's kind of similar to that one. You'll notice that the only difference between number five and number six is um, the vector value, uh, vector field. So it's slightly different than this vector field and the, the region or the, the solid that we're talking about has basically a different radius on the circle, okay? So it's very, very similar. So you should be able to use number six to kind of um, help you out with that one. So you will see the similarities on my hint for number five and then what I've used for G in number um, six. Now, I did wanna point this out because this is super important. Um, if you're doing a problem, the direction in which it, the curve is moving does matter. So if it were going clockwise, then um, yes, you can turn this integral with an N ds into the gradient of G dA. That's important to know because we did that on number three. Um, but if you're going clockwise, your G is actually gonna be your function in terms of X, Y minus the Z. So basically if they give you Z equals something, you're basically minusing the Z over to that side, okay? But if they say counterclockwise, then the Z stays put and it's all of these terms that have to move over to that side, okay? So be very, very careful when trying to um, identify your capital G, okay? And since number five does say counterclockwise, that is why I did Z minus the, uh, what they had for Z, right? So I moved these terms over to the left. Um, and I think number six and number seven do the same thing. So I will leave Z where it is and then move over the other terms, okay, to find capital G. So I did go ahead and figure out the curl for number six. So I set it all up. I put my components underneath. I did do all the partial derivatives and this was the result of the curl. Again, if you need to see that all worked out step-by-step, step, please try to do it on your own and verify that you get the same thing as me. If you don't, you can always text me and I'll uh, figure out where it went wrong. 
Okay. Now, if I'm wanting to figure out what this looks like on the x, y plane, what I did was is I put zero for z, and I ended up with just zero equal to 25 minus x squared minus y squared. Well, then I added the x squared and the y squared over to the left-hand side, so I ended up with x squared plus y squared equal to 25. And so that's what told me I was talking about a circle. So I knew for the circle, since the radius was five, it was gonna go from zero to five, and since it was the whole circle, the theta would go from zero to two pi. Um, I also know that z was greater than or equal to zero, so it's gonna be from zero up into that plane. Um, but I realized that since I'm gonna be using r's and thetas, I wanted to convert this into polar coordinates. So now I have where z is going in polar coordinates, where r is going in polar coordinates, and then where theta is going in polar coordinates. So everything in polar coordinates. Not that it matters because I'm not doing a triple integral, but you just definitely need to convert z into polar coordinates. Um, now, so I let g, g be z minus what they had for z, and so I ended up with z minus 25 plus x squared plus y squared, and if I find the gradient of that, the derivative of this whole thing with respect to x is 2x, the derivative of this whole thing with respect to y is 2y, and the derivative of the whole thing with respect to z is 1, okay? So, um, what I did here was I used the Stokes theorem, but then I actually converted this into the gradient of G. This is the gradient of G and then DA. So basically the NDS stuff becomes the gradient of G DA. Okay, so that's what changed there. And because I'm doing DA instead of DS, this is R instead of S. Okay, so basically instead of a surface integral, it's just a double integral, okay, for with respect to area. So the curl is here, that's what I got. And then this uh, gradient of G is here and I just left DA is DA. I did go ahead and compute this. Um, so four X times two X is um, eight X squared. Negative four Y times two Y is negative eight Y squared. Four X times two Y is positive eight X Y and then zero times one is zero, okay? Um, I did go ahead and put everything in polar corn polar coordinates, my region, everything. So my region is going to go from 0 to 2 pi for theta and 0 to 5 for r. This is going to become 8. Um, I actually did factor out the 8. So the x squared becomes r squared cosine squared. The y squared becomes um, r squared sine squared. And then the xy becomes r squared cosine theta sine theta. And then, of course, dA becomes r dr d theta from the whole Jacobian situation, right? Um, so I did go ahead and all of these had an R squared. So I did factor that R squared out and combined it with this R that was already there. So I ended up with R cubed. Um, and then I did use a trig identity to convert that to cosine of two theta. Um, and then I kind of used another one to convert that into sine of two theta over two. And the reason why is because this one's very straightforward. This does equal this. But for the other one, it's two sine theta cosine theta that equals sine of two theta. And I had the cosine and the sine, but I didn't have this two. So I just divided both sides by two. And that's why sine theta cosine theta became sine of two theta over two, okay? Um, again, I'm just writing that lightly because that's really just pre-cal stuff, identities. Um, but those identities are necessary in order for us to do this um, integration. I probably could have integrated this without converting it just by using u sub, but since I was already converting this one to a double angle, I just went ahead and converted that one to a double angle. But there are many methods on how to solve this integration, okay? Some people use the half angle identities or, or the double angle identities. It just depends on which way you wanted to go, okay? There are many ways to find this integration because there are so many different uh, trigonomic identities to choose from, okay? This is just what I did when I did the problem, okay? Um, so I converted that to cosine of two theta. I converted this to sine two theta over two. And then I also integrated this R cubed with respect to R. So I got R to the fourth power over four. And I evaluated that from zero to five. And I did go ahead and reduce this eight and this four, and that's where this two came from. And when I did uh, five to the fourth power, I got 625. And when I went zero to the fourth power, I got zero. 
So two times 625 is where this 1250 came from. And then I do use, I did use my u sub. So I said, let u equal to theta. So d theta or du, I'm sorry, would be two d theta. I divided both sides by theta. So this became a u, this became a u. I wrote this instead of as over two, I wrote it as a multiple of one half. Um, and then the d theta changed into du over two. So I did take this two down here and put it outside. So 1250 over two turned back into 625. The integral of cosine u is sine u. Here's my constant multiplier. The integral of sine u is negative cosine of u. So these two turned into a negative one half and I back sub what u was. So u was two theta. So there's the two theta and the two theta. And I still have to evaluate it at my bounds from zero to two pi for theta. So when I plugged in two pi, I came up with these two um, terms. And then when I plugged in zero, I came up with these two terms. And so then the sine of four pi is zero minus the cosine of four pi is one times the negative one half is negative one half. That minus is this minus here. Sine of zero is zero. Cosine of zero is one times negative one half is negative one half. So what I ultimately ended up with inside the brackets was negative one half plus one half, which is zero and 625 times zero is zero. And so that's the value that we ended up for problem six. Now for problem seven, it's very similar, just a different vector valued function and of course a different region, okay? So this one was a little bit tricky. Um, in order for me to figure out uh, what was going on in the xy plane, I really had to consider well, um, basically let z equal zero. So if you let z equal to zero, and I, this was also my reasoning behind why, um, since you're only doing the positive radical, you're only talking about the half, the top half, the positive um, z's in the sphere. So it's only what's above the xy plane. I tried drawing a sphere, but I'm not great at drawing 3D. Um, but what we did end up with on the xy plane, if you let z equals zero, you have this. And if I square both sides, I get this. And then if I add the x and the y over, I end up with this, okay? So that is a circle with a radius of two. So I drew it in the xy plane. So if it's a circle, the whole circle, it's gonna be from zero to two for r and zero to two pi for theta. I did also convert a z into polar coordinates since I'm obviously gonna end up with polar coordinates, okay? Um, so remember, if you factor out the negative, this is just four minus x squared plus y squared and x squared plus y squared is r squared. So ultimately you end up with four minus r squared. Now, um, I did do the curl here and so I am gonna have to convert my curl into polar coordinates, which I will do when I get to the part where I plug everything in. Um, but for now, I did. it is going counterclockwise again. So we have Z minus what we were given for Z. Um, and I rewrote it so that it looks like an exponent instead of a radical. And I have to find the gradient. So the derivative of this with respect to X, well, the derivative of Z with respect to X is zero. So you have this negative. You bring down your power and decrease the power by one. And I get that. But then the chain rule means I have to take the derivative of the base with respect to x, so I got negative 2x. Then I repeat the same process for y, and then the derivative of this with respect to z is just 1. None of this has these in it, so it would just be 0. Um, and then the negative 2 and the negative 1 half basically cancel, so I literally just have x times that parentheses to the negative 1 half. Similarly, the same thing happens here. I end up with y times this thing to the negative 1 half. And then my third component is still one. And I did convert everything into um, uh, polar coordinates. So x becomes r cosine theta. This became four minus r squared. Still with that negative exponent, this became r sine squared. This became four minus r squared. Still with the negative one half exponent and one stays one. Now I did write them as fractions, right? Because the negative means it goes downstairs. The one half means it's a house. So you basically have a house of four minus r squared um, below the fraction bar. So you end up with these two terms and then of course the one stays a one. So using Stokes theorem, we end up from here to here with the double integral. 
And then from here to here, we're using this relationship there, okay? So um, I am gonna go ahead and use my gradient of G. So here's the curl of F in terms of um, in polar coordinates. So the X is um, R cosine theta, the Z is this radical, right? And then here you have minus two times Z again. So there's the radical again, comma, R sine theta for Y, and then the square root of four minus R squared for Z, comma zero. Then my gradient was this fraction, this fraction one, and then the DA will become, because I'm doing polar coordinates, will become R D R D theta. So here I went ahead and I multiplied this times this. So the radicals will cancel, one on top, one on bottom. And I end up with these two multiplied together, which is negative R squared cosine squared. I also have to multiply this first component by the second term of the first component over here. So it's basically that one gets distributed because there's two terms in the first component. So again, the radicals would cancel and I'll just end up with negative two times R cosine theta. Now, when we do the second components, we end up with our, uh, the radicals still cancel and we end up with R squared sine squared and then zero times one is just zero. Now I did distribute the R, I got kind of crammed in here. So I hope that I, you know, me saying the words will help you figure out what this says, okay? So I did distribute the R. So this is negative R cubed cosine squared, negative two R squared cosine theta plus R cubed sine squared theta and then dr d theta. So right in there, I know it's real swished, but it's dr d theta. So then I did integrate with respect to r. So this term became negative r4 over four. This is just a constant multiplier. Minus two times r cubed over three, constant multiplier cosine theta, plus uh, r to the fourth power over four, constant multiplier sine squared theta. And I do have to evaluate r from zero to two, and I still have the d theta. So then when I plugged in two, I ended up with this coefficient negative four. When I plugged in two, I ended up with this coefficient negative 16 over three. When I plugged in two, I ended up with the coefficient four. And if you plug in a bunch of zeros, you're just gonna get a bunch of zeros and I didn't bother writing plus or minus zero, okay? Um, now when I integrate each of these, actually um, I regrouped them and factored out. So what I did was I took these two terms and I, in my mind, they were next to each other because you can use associative property to swap these two, right? But instead of writing it out again with these two swap, they just did it in my brain. And then I factored out a negative four. So when you factor out a negative four, that becomes positive cosine squared. But when you factor out a negative four here, it becomes negative sine squared. So that when you distribute this negative four, you do get these two terms, okay? And this middle term, I just put it off to the side. So again, this I converted into cosine of two theta. This one I left alone. There's no conversion needed there. I did separate the integral into the integral of the first term and then minus the integral of the second term. And so for this term, I did use u substitution. So if I let u equal two theta, then du is gonna be du, I mean, d theta is gonna be du over two. Here I brought the next 16 over three down, but I still have to integrate cosine of theta d theta. So for this first term, I ended up with negative four and I kept the over two, I just laid it over to the negative four, but the integral of cosine u du is sine of u. Then I have this constant multiplier, the integral of cosine of theta is sine of theta. I did have the back sub what u was. So I did this division and I got negative two and then this should have been sine of two theta. This term remains the same. And now I can evaluate theta from zero to two pi. So when I plugged in two pi, I get four pi here, and then here I get just two pi. When I plug in zero, I get zero for both of those angles. So sine of four pi is zero, um, sine of two pi is zero. So this whole first term is just gonna be zero minus sine of zero is zero and sine of zero is zero. So this also would end up being um, just another zero. And zero minus zero, of course, is zero. And so that's where we ended up with those values. Um, but this is the last lecture video that we will have. Um, the only other remaining videos that we'll have is the review for the final exam. And then that is the end. So congrats on making it this far. And I wish you guys the best of luck on the end of uh, course exams.